This lecture will cover the Chapter 21 Nuclear Chemistry notes that we do in AP Chemistry. And the first thing that we talk about with nuclear chemistry is just the general definition of it. It's the study of nuclear reactions and how those reactions are used. Then we look at the definition of radioactivity. When a nuclei changes spontaneously, it emits energy and it's said to be radioactive. Now the nucleons are what we call the particles that are in the nucleus, and those are the protons which have a positive charge and the neutrons which are neutral. Now the mass number of an element is the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So in other words, it's the total number of nucleons. Now we don't need to worry about the electrons uh, changing the mass of an element because the electrons weigh much, much less than the protons in the nucleus or the neutrons in the nucleus. Now the atomic number of an element is the whole number that's on a periodic table and it's obviously the number of protons. And if you wanted to calculate the neutrons, you could subtract the mass number minus the atomic number. So in essence, what you're doing is you're taking the protons plus the neutrons in the nucleus, that's the mass number, and you're subtracting out the protons. Now, what's the definition of an isotope? On the next slide we have it. It says that isotopes have the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. So it's basically an element that's a little fatter. So it's uranium-235 and uranium-238 is the example. Those are isotopes of uranium. Uranium-235 has less neutrons in the nucleus. Uranium-238 has more neutrons, but they have the same number of protons. Now, a different isotope of an element is distinguished by the mass number, and the mass number is usually written after the symbol, as shown up above. Now, different isotopes have different natural abundances. For example, uranium-238 is the more abundant uranium. It's 99.3% of all the uranium in the world, and uranium-235 is a trace amount, and it's the uranium-235 that's used in atom bombs. Now here's a practice problem for us. How many protons and neutrons are in uranium-238? We look on the periodic table. We know that uranium is number 92, so that's the number of protons. It also happens to equal the number of electrons when uranium is electrically neutral. And if you wanted to find the neutrons, you could subtract, and you'll get the total number of neutrons as 238 minus 92, which is 146. Now we're going to look at nuclear equations. Most nuclei are stable. Most nucleuses, those are called nuclei, of an element is stable. Now a radionuclide is an unstable nucleus, so it has a radioactive uh, characteristic to it. So atoms that contain radionuclei are called radioisotopes. Radionuclides spontaneously emit particles. They give off particles when their nucleus breaks apart, and they also can give off electromagnetic radiation in the form of gamma rays. So here's an example. Uranium-238 is naturally radioactive and it emits alpha particles, which happens to be a helium nucleus. It contains two protons and two neutrons. That's called an alpha particle. So when a nucleus spontaneously decomposes in this manner, we say that it has decayed or it's undergone radioactive decay. So here's what a nuclear equation looks like. Uh, basically what you need to know is the total number of nucleons is conserved. So we can represent uranium-238 decay by the following nuclear equation. The top number is the number of nucleons, and the bottom number is basically the charge or the number of protons uh, of the nucleus. So we have 238 on the left, and then you can notice that the top numbers on the right side of the equation still add up to 238. The bottom numbers also add up. So the top number is conserved and the bottom number is conserved. And so the uranium-238, when it spits out a helium nucleus, it turns into a thorium element. It happens to be thorium that weighs 234, or the mass number is 234. Now there are different types of radioactive decay. There are three types to consider. Alpha particles, which we just saw in the last example, is the loss of a helium nucleus. A uh, nucleus can also spit out beta radiation, which is the loss of a high-speed electron. Now the electron has zero for the mass number on top, and it has a charge of negative one. Also, you can have gamma radiation, which is the loss of a high-energy photon, or a gamma ray. Now gamma particles, because they're electromagnetic radiation, radiation have no mass and no charge. So the symbol is the gamma symbol with zero, zero. Now in nuclear chemistry, to ensure conservation of nucleons, we, we write all particles with their atomic number and their mass number. So that's what you see up above. 
Now the atomic number of an electron is, happens to be a negative one, so it's kind of weird looking. Um, so that's just the notation that we use. Now atoms can also undergo two other types of decay. There's something called a positron. A positron is basically an electron, but it happens to have a positive charge. It's the exact opposite of an electron. It weighs the same, has the same mass number, but the charge is going to be one. So the symbol for a positron is going to be E zero over one. Now you could also write it as the beta symbol, but add a little positive sign. So instead of beta negative, it's actually beta positive. The other thing that an atom can do is capture an electron. So uh, uh, the nucleus captures an electron from the electron cloud surrounding the nucleus, and then that will change the nucleus. So let's take a look at this little picture. It shows that if you have a radioactive substance and you watch that radioactive substance decay. If you look at the particles that are spit out from the nucleus, some of them have um, charges and so they're deflected by the electrically charged plates. The beta rays go up towards the positive charge because they're electrons, so they're attracted upwards. The alpha particles, which are positive, are deflected downwards away from the positive towards the negative. And a gamma ray is a pure energy, so it doesn't have any charges, it just goes straight. On the next chart, we look at the charge of the positive uh, alpha particle. It happens to be positive 2 because there's two protons. Beta is negative 1. Gamma rays do not have any charge. You look at the relative masses. Basically, an alpha particle is pretty darn heavy. Beta particle, hardly any mass. And gamma is pure energy, so it's zero mass. Now, the penetrating power is how far it would go into your skin or into a material. Alpha particles have a low penetrating power on a scale of 1 to 10,000, I guess we're looking at. Alpha particles are a 1. Beta particles, the high-speed electrons, have a penetrating power of 100, and gamma rays can have high penetrating power, so they do the most damage to your cells, and that has a penetrating power of a thousand, or 10,000. Now, subatomic particles can also undergo decay as well. So a neutron can actually uh, produce a beta particle, and it turns in itself into a proton. In, in more specific terms, we're looking at quarks. There's an up quark, which um, an up, I think it's up quark, an up quark, and a down quark is a proton, and then if it's up, down, down, that's a neutron. But basically, one of the quarks changes from an up to a down, or a down to an up. I don't remember which one it is, and it's not important right now. But anyway, a neutron turns into a proton and spits out an electron. Now, there's also something called positron annihilation. That's where a positron runs into its exact opposite, which is an electron, and it just turns into pure energy, and it's a couple gamma rays. And then you can have positron emission, where a proton turns into a neutron, and then it creates a positron. So you can have a neutron turn into a proton, or you can have a proton turn into a neutron. Those are uh, subatomic particles undergoing decay. There's also electron capture, where a proton can smash into an electron and turn into a neutron. Now notice that in each case, in each equation that we've written up above, the top numbers and the bottom numbers are balanced. Now here's a practice problem. What product is formed when radium-226 undergoes alpha decay? So we write down radium-226. We know that it's going to spit out an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus with four on the top and two on the bottom. So we know the top number has to be 222 to be conserved, and the bottom number has to be 86. So if you look on the periodic table, number 86 is radon. So this would turn into radon-226. So radium turns into radon. And this page just shows more symbols for the neutrons, protons, electrons, alpha particles, beta particles, and the positron. So here's another practice problem. What type of particle is emitted when carbon-11 decays into boron-11? So we write the reaction. We have carbon-11 on the left, boron-11 on the right. We know that the top number has to be a 0 and the bottom number has to be a 1. That's called a positron. So this would be positron emission. Now we talk about nuclear stability. Nuclear stability is basically talking about what makes a nucleus radioactive. Now a proton has a high mass and a high charge, and therefore the repulsion of two protons in the nucleus is pretty darn large. So in order for the nucleus to remain stable, there has to be a strong nuclear force, that's actually what it's called, the strong nuclear force, involved. And it's the attractive force between a neutron and a proton that are very, 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 very close 
um, to each other. So if you get a neutron and a proton close to enough, close enough to each other, they're basically glued together by the strong nuclear force. And the strong nuclear force is much stronger than the repulsion between two positive protons. Now, as more protons are added, the nucleus gets heavier and the proton-proton repulsion gets larger. Therefore, you're going to have to use more neutrons to glue the nucleus together for it to be stable. Now, there's something called the belt of stability. That basically is the neutron to proton ratio of stable atoms. Now, when you have a lighter element like hydrogen and helium and, and carbon, you'll notice that the ratio of protons to neutrons or neutrons to protons is basically one to one. For example, carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons. So there's an even amount of protons and neutrons. But as they get heavier and heavier, and heavier you're going to need more and more neutrons to make it stable. So the belt of stability deviates from a one to one ratio for higher atomic masses. Now at bismuth, which is number 83 on the periodic table, the belt of stability ends and all the nuclei greater than that are unstable. So if you have 84 protons or more, you're going to be radioactive. So starting with polonium, all um, nuclei are inherently unstable. Now if you're above the belt of stability, which means your neutron ratio is greater than one to one, or great, it's, you have more neutrons than protons, your ratio is too big, you're going to undergo beta emission. So you lose an electron and the number of neutrons decreases. So if your neutron to proton ratio is too high, you're going to lose an electron and that'll uh, decrease your number of neutrons. And the proton uh, would go up. So this is an example. Sodium-24 is unstable and it will decompose by spitting out an electron and it will turn into magnesium-24. So basically what happens is um, one of your, one of your um, neutrons turns into a proton when it spits out an electron. And the source of the electron, again, as I just said, is the neutron turning into the proton. And again, one of the quarks changes from an up to a down or down to an up. Again, I can't remember. Now, nuclei that are below the belt of stability undergo positron emission or electron capture, capture. And this results in the number of neutrons increasing and then the number of protons would go down. So it's basically the opposite of what we just saw. And here's an example. Phosphorus 30 is unstable. It's going to decompose and turn into silicon 30. And you can see that the protons goes from 15 down to 14, but the neutrons uh, goes from uh, 15 to 16 as the positron is released and the source of the positron is one of the protons turning into a neutron. Now, nuclei with atomic numbers greater than 83 usually undergo alpha emission, so the number of protons and neutrons both decreases in uh, steps of two. So the protons go down by two and the neutrons go down by two. And here's an example, polonium-212 turns into lead-208. So the protons went down uh, by two and the neutrons went down by two for a total mass loss of four. Now here's just a visual of this. If you're uh, below the belt of stability, you lose a positron or you gain an electron. If you're above the belt of stability, you're going to lose an electron. And if you're crazy high, like above 83 for your atomic mass, for your number of uh, nuclei, for number of protons, I should say, you're going to uh, release an alpha particle, which is the helium nucleus. Continuing on with nuclear stability, what mode of decay would you expect for carbon-14 and xenon-118? So let's first look at carbon-14. The ratio of protons to neutrons is higher than a typical one-to-one -one ratio, so we have too many neutrons. So we'll probably try to get our neutrons decreasing, and you can do that by beta emission. So here's what it would look like. You take the carbon, which weighs 14, and you change the atomic number 6 to atomic number 7, that will increase the number of protons to get the ratio uh, closer to 1 to 1. So it turns into nitrogen 14. So you're, again, above a 1 to 1 ratio, and you need to decrease your um, ratio. For xenon 118, it has 64 neutrons and 54 protons. The ratio is 1.2. Now this nuclei should have a higher ratio of neutrons to protons, so it could 
uh, be thought of as being below the belt of stability. And so you're going to have to do the opposite of what we just talked about. So instead of beta emission, you could do positron emission or an electron capture. And here I show an electron capture. So xenon captures one of its own electrons and it turns into iodine, 50, uh, which uh, has an atomic number 53. And the uh, mass number is still 118. Now, if you want to do it by um, positron emission, this is what it looks like. You still turn it into iodine-118, but it's just a different way of looking at the equation. Now we're going to look at a radioactive series. These are the sequential steps where one nucleus changes into another, which changes into another, which changes into another by radioactive decay each time. Now, a nucleus usually undergoes more than one transition on its path to stability. So something like uranium just doesn't turn into a stable nucleus in one step. It takes a long time before the uranium finally gets to an isotope that is stable. So the series of, nucle the, the series of nuclear reactions that accompany this path is called a radioactive series. Now, nuclei resulting from radioactive decay are called daughter nuclei. So uranium would be considered the mother, and then you have all these daughter nuclei that are created when uranium breaks apart. So so as you see up above, uranium turns into thorium, and then the thorium turns into palladium, and then it turns back into uranium, but it's of uranium that only weighs 234, where the original uranium, uranium weighed 238, and then it goes down to thorium and radium and radon and polonium. Those uh, big diagonal steps are by alpha particles being uh, given off. So the number of uh, protons decreases by two, and then you get down to lead eventually, um, it's lead 208, I believe. Or maybe on this chart it looks like it's lead 206. But anyway, most radioactive elements that are above lead end up being lead. Now, the radioactive series shown is for uranium 238. There are other radioactive series for um, different elements. Now here's some further observations on nuclear stability. Certain numbers of neutrons and protons are inherently stable. It turns out that these are called magic numbers. If you have 2, 8, 20, 20, 8, 50, or 82 protons, it's very stable. And if you have neutrons of 2, 8, 20, 20, 8, 50, 82, and even 126, it's very, very stable. So for some reason, nature likes these numbers, so they're called magic numbers. Finally, if you have a nuclei with an even number of protons and neutrons, it's going to be more stable than an isotope with an odd number of protons and neutrons. So we're going to look at an example. Which one would you expect to be more stable, calcium-40 or calcium-41? Well, both calciums have 20 protons, which is a magic number for protons, but calcium-40 has 20 neutrons, which is very stable, and calcium-41 has 21 neutrons, so the odd number of nuclei, or nucleons, I'm sorry, the odd number of nucleons would probably make the calcium-41 less stable, and calcium-40 being the perfect uh, the magic numbers of 20 and 20 would be more stable. Now let's look at lead 208 and astatine 210. Now astatine, AT on the periodic table, has 85 protons. So that's an odd number, so it's going to be less stable than lead, which is 82 protons. And again, 82 protons is a magic number for the lead. Finally, we're going to look at synthesis of nucle nuclides in this lecture. Now, a stable nuclei can actually be converted into an other uh, into another nucleus uh, that might be stable, it might be unstable, but you can actually turn one element into another or one nuclei into another nuclei by bombarding the stable nuclei with another nucleus or with some high-speed particles. So this is called nuclear transmutations, and that's the collision of one nucleus with another nucleus. So nuclear transmutations uh, can occur using high-velocity alpha particles. So if you take a nucleus as a target and you shoot an alpha particle at it, if you shoot it at the right speed and at the right angle and all this crazy highfalutin physics-y stuff, you can get them to collide together and stick. Instead of just splitting the atom apart, they actually stick and create a new particle. So here's nitrogen-14 smashed with a helium nuclei, which is an alpha particle again, and it turns into oxygen-17, which happens to be radioactive and unstable. And uh, in order to conserve um, nuclides, or, uh, we have to have a proton spit out of there. Many of these transmutations require a lot of energy, and you have to overcome the electrostatic forces between the two particles. Uh, both the nuclei will have part of, uh, positive charges, and so they'll try to repel each other if they get uh, next to each other. So you have to smash them together, and they're called atom smashers. And we're going to stop the lecture here, and I'll continue the lecture on radioactive decay in part two.